Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Lindsay Hook. I'm from the US. I am working, have been working with the World Food Forum and FAO for quite some time now to put this incredible event together. So it's really amazing to see how it's come together and to have all of you here and just to really put our heads together and make a difference difference together. So today I have the honor to present a really fun and interactive and dynamic way for people to learn more about the SDGs, sustainable agri-food systems, and much, much more. So let's just dive right in. So in the quest to transform global agri-food systems, reducing food loss and waste seems like a straightforward way to fight hunger, increase access to healthy diets, and protect the environment. But the reality is much more complicated. Solving one problem may unintentionally lead to unexpected consequences somewhere else. Change the game, change the future, a new game platform will help policymakers and the public learn the role that data can play in addressing these trade-offs and help them choose the most effective policies. So to start off, I think the best way to demonstrate this is actually to show you this. So I would invite my colleague to go ahead and show a short video. The way food is grown and how we feed the world is complex. Reducing food loss and waste, improving health outcomes, or even responding to climate change all require making the right choices for people and the planet. Change the Game, Change the Future is a powerful new decision-making platform. It blends insight and analysis with real-time data from over 190 countries to show how policymakers across the globe can make the right interventions, achieving the goal of improving food and nutrition security while minimizing social, economic, and environmental trade-offs that address our agri-food system's greatest challenges. To begin, choose from one of 17 regions across the globe. Each offers different barriers and opportunities. To make the right interventions, you can seek guidance from agri-food system experts. But what works in one part of the world might lead to unexpected consequences somewhere else. Finding the proper balance can increase farmer productivity, provide greater access to food, improve efficiency in the use of their natural resources, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions to meet a region's sustainable development goals by 2030. Can you change the game and change your future? Amazing, thank you so much for that seamless screen share, might I add. Not always easy, so thank you so much. Uh, so our first question actually goes to Maximo. So my question is, Agri-food systems transformation and food waste and loss are really complex issues. So why did you decide to build a game about it? Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And, and it's a dream come true that we have uh, this game and especially launch at the World Food Forum. So I think there were three issues that we wanted to work together with, with the team uh, and, and with David Labor, which is also here, Chloe, and, 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 and with Catherine. And, and especially Douglas also, which helped us on, on all this process. First, we had a big problem in the Food System Summit. And the problem was that we need to be very clear what was the objective function that we wanted to achieve. Remember, when we were talking of food systems or agri-food systems, we were talking about food and giving food to people, giving access to healthy diets. So the objective function was clear, increasing the access to healthy diets so that everybody can have access. We have 3 billion people didn't have access. But when you want to achieve that, there are constraints that you will be confront. There are potential negative effects on our environment. Assume that we were just intensifying production to produce all what we need to give access to healthy diets. That will mean land expansion that will affect biodiversity, will affect the use of water, the use of land, the use of energy. Uh, but there can also be positive synergies. Uh, and the problem is that normally we don't know them. We just act in silos and we focus on on achieving one goal without understanding what are the consequences that have on other potential competing issues. 
and not only on other compet uh, competing issues in your country, but also across the world, because it could affect other countries. When we talk of greenhouse gas emissions, we are talking of a common world uh, public good that could be affected. So this complexity was difficult to understand. And what best to work with a game in which we can help people to understand with real information, with real modeling behind, so all the reality that we can bring to help people to understand what this concept means. That if they wanted in this specific case, that is the first that we are touching here to reduce food loss and waste, what will be the consequences on land, on water, on soil, on biodiversity, on consumers, and, and what that will imply, and what that will imply to other countries. And, we, and the game basically is trying to do that. You can make choices, you can make decisions to achieve your objective functions, but we will tell you what will be the consequences of those, of those choices. And this is extremely important because it helps countries to better understand what are the pathways that they are choosing and what are the costs and benefits of those pathways, the trade-offs of those pathways, and how, if necessary, they can change those pathways to a pathway which could be better, where you minimize those trade-offs and optimize the potential synergies. So this identification of pathways to achieve this objective function and to minimize the trade-offs and optimize the synergies was the goal uh, that we wanted to achieve with this uh, game uh, that has now uh, is starting to be launched. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maximo. I think you really, really answered the question perfectly and brought it all together. It sounds like this is an incredible revolutionary opportunity for policymakers and the public to have a sort of practice round of making decisions that it doesn't sound like that's ever been uh, you know, created before. And it's an amazing way to kind of see the entire system and how it comes together. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my next question is for Douglas. And before I get there, I do, speaking of questions, want to remind the audience that we will have a question and answer session later, in which case you should put your questions that you have down in the Q&A box, and we will be calling on you uh, or choosing your question and having it answered. So be sure to put those in as you think of them. So back to Douglas, uh, I am told that you've put together a sneak preview of Change the Game, Change the Future to share today. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time that you've shared the game with the public. That's correct. I've shared it with my 15 year old daughter. So it's not the first time <laughs> that, that other eyes have seen it, but we're definitely excited to share the work today. I wanna to point out that it's not complete. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress, but we think it's important to share where we are with the group because ultimately it's a platform for telling the story of food system transformation that we would like to invite all of the members of the World Food Forum to join us in. And we'll get into how we propose that a little bit later uh, today. Um, I think Maximo, you made an amazing uh, explanation of the work that this group has been doing. I think the one thing for me that attracted us to work on it is that I think often people have data that is valuable data that could be transformational data but it's locked in a spreadsheet, Lindsay. So when you have information that's locked in a spreadsheet, it's, it's hard to motivate and move people, right? You have to put a face and a place on data sometimes and make it closer to people so that they can see themselves in a solution. And when it's backed up by data, by actual real facts, um, it makes it all the more powerful. And so that's what we've endeavored to do. What I'm gonna do, um, if, uh, if, if it's okay, Lindsay, is walk us through some key elements of the game. And then members of our team are gonna explain the rationale, the decision-making behind what we're doing. Um, because obviously it's not a game made by one person. If there's, there's a whole team that's working on it. So um, are you able to see my screen, Lindsay? Yes, I am. Okay, cool. So again, what we're showing you uh, is uh, what's called uh, in the game world an MVP, which means a minimum viable product. It's just a, it's not even, sometimes you might hear things beta. This is not even beta, this is what's called alpha, which means that you can actually click through it and it won't crash. And so, uh, so this is again, uh, just a, a quick overview of what we put together. Maximo's talked a lot about trade-offs, about the importance of being able to weigh the consequences of our actions and unintended outcomes that might happen even halfway around the world. So how do you show those? And so the, the context that the group decided to focus on for this first iteration is food loss and waste. 
But understand when you're looking at this, that it's a platform. It's a platform for explaining data and food system transformation. The first expression of that is food loss and waste. But I'm sure you guys can imagine, as you've talked about many themes today and all your different meetings that you've been having, that there's a range of themes that this group could tackle by using this platform. It's designed to be what's a, what I would call a reusable platform that can be used for storytelling across different themes. So don't only think of this as a way that all this effort and energy has gone to something to just explain food loss and food waste. You can already see, for those of you who attended the early morning session, the use of foodicons, which are our icon system that are being used here. This group decided to focus on food loss and food waste. And they decided to focus on explaining it through a series of lenses. And those lenses begin by looking at the social, environmental, and the economic um, aspects that you would have to discuss when you're looking at, uh, at anything of this nature. These indicators are really key in explaining the connection between decisions you make and, for example, the SDGs. But also, um, they get into what, um, what we call the spheres of sustainability. So we can actually explain these here. And, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, uh, just trying to figure out, perhaps uh, Chloe and Katrin, you can go a little bit into what the spheres of sustainability mean uh, for this project. Um, so, um, you know, Douglas, you've mentioned, um, you know, the social, environmental and economic aspects. And, you know, when you make a decision in one aspect, um, it has an unintended consequence for another aspect. So what we are trying to do here is to help the players understand that the decisions that they make has a consequences. And by considering all those trade-offs, um, eventually they would be able to balance um, and, and achieve a state where their economic, social, and environmental interests um, are coming together. And this could mean different things for different countries, depending on where they are. So if a country has a very large young population, they might be interested in, um, you know, creating more jobs, and that could mean um, generating more greenhouse gas emissions. But maybe they're okay with that as long as it doesn't get out of control. So um, the spheres of sustainability tries to show the players um, the the balancing act, and that there is a state or space where they can achieve those balance. Thank you, Katrin. Also, another important lens is the sustainable development goals, especially as we are moving towards 2030 and trying to hit a number of targets, which this game actually helps to explain. Maybe Chloe, you can explain to us the role of the SDGs and how they've impacted the design of this game. Yeah, so the game definitely speaks to the SDGs and meeting these targets by 2030. Um, so each of the six scoring indicators that you see here um, is linked to the SDGs. And here we're showing just the most relevant ones in relation to our scoring indicators, but there are 17 total SDGs and they're all interrelated and food loss and waste interact with the other ones as well. Um, for example, on the screen, you can see that food security is captured in SDG two, which is to end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition and to promote sustainable agriculture, all of which are aspects that are addressed in the game. And then the other indicators are similarly related to other SGs. Thank you, Chloe. The way the game works is very simple. It's, the world has been divided into 17 regions and you can select any region and actually make decisions from the standpoint of how you can mitigate food loss and food waste by making a series of interventions. So in the case of, you might choose for example, West Africa. Maybe David, you can explain to us how we define a region so the player understands what makes that region unique in terms of both challenges and opportunities. Yes, thank you, Douglas, and thanks everyone for being with us today. Um, it has been, and I think it's clear for everyone that the world is complex, but at least it's very rich. And we should never try to simplify it or oversimplify it by thinking that everyone is the same, or let's talk about Africa. 
Africa is a continent, more than 50 countries. So we try to keep this diversity and this diversity that are in the data. Now, we cannot, even if we use data for 190 countries, our goal in this game is not to start building a story for 190 countries, because then uh, the players will never stop exploring the game. Uh, but also it's not about, you know, pointing the finger to one specific country or another, but try to put countries that are similar together, that face similarities in their ecosystem, similarities in their cultural approach to, to food system, or um, how they manage a market, and in some cases also similarities in terms of institution. So we have built these 17 a group of countries that are regions and basically the player can select at the beginning of the game one region where he will face uh, the specific challenges and opportunities and of course during the game you start to learn more about you know what is the situation of your agri-food system in these regions how for example this uh, food waste and loss issue is a, a major issue or not and therefore that will lead the player to specific choice for each region so we try to have a simplification of the world, but not to give you a simplistic picture that one size fits all in this world. Fantastic. So once you have selected, you can either choose to select this region, West Africa, or you could go back and choose another region. Once you've selected a region, you're given the opportunity to make a series of interventions. Maximo, how did you determine these interventions with the team? And why are they so critical in terms of the responses that people can make to these challenges? Sure, food loss and waste is a topic that, that we work a lot uh, at FAO, at IFPI, and, and in many places, uh, in many institutions in the, in the world. And the solutions and the action oriented is what we need. We know that there is 14% of losses in the world and 17% of waste. But there are solutions that go from institutional interventions the way we organize things to, to bring a solution, the rules of the game, which could be a standard, for example. There are solutions that could be infrastructure. For example, right now we are working on, on how to create the storage facilities and cooling facilities so that you can expand the shelf life of the product. And to behavioral interventions, which are mostly extremely relevant for the case of waste, no? how we can change the way people consume the food so that they minimize the, the way they waste. But in any of these type of interventions to combat food loss and waste that countries could adopt, there are costs and benefits. There are potential effects, positive or negative. Building roads, uh, building facilities for cooling could create costs in our environment. Even doing institutional interventions, like for example, also bringing subsidies to do something, it could create consequences and expansion of land or intensification of land that could create trade-offs. And the same on behavioral change. So the goal is, okay, what I will choose and how I will get feedback and how I get advice to make the best choice and to understand the consequences of those choices so that we can model them properly and then allow to identify what is the best action that you need to take as a policymaker. Back to you. Thank you. The interventions that you're able to make uh, are presented to you in a dashboard. You're given an actual budget where you can actually spend the funds for infrastructure and behavior interventions but you can also expend political capital in terms of the institutional decisions that you might make. If you wanna build a road, for example, you might need to seek advice. Katrin, in working to write out how these interventions might work and how advice might be given, maybe you can share a little bit with the team about how you approached that challenge from a storytelling standpoint of telling the, the story of all the different types of advice and insight that one can solicit in making these decisions. And you're, you're muted, Katrin. Sorry. Um, so there are, the players will come and see, you know, they, they have three types of um, intervention, right? So there's the infrastructure interventions, um, institution and behavioral interventions. And the way you can think of it, for instance, uh, for infrastructure, is that um, you could think of it as a hardware. And any institution-related intervention would be like a software. And any behavioral intervention would be considered as a, you know, um, the user who uses the software on a hardware. So they all go together. Uh, but what you will see is that um, by choosing one, again, you're going to be causing um, or causing an, um, 
an effect in an area that you hadn't um, expected. So for instance, cold storage. If you have cold storage, um, you know, it's sort of like having a refrigerator. So you could keep your food fresh for a longer period of time, which would be great, you know, in reducing food loss. However, because cold storage facilities uses, um, use um, electricity, you want to make sure that um, whoever needs cold storage um, also has access to electricity. Um, so that means uh, making sure that not only big food producers, but also smallholder farmers have access to um, electricity. So that means uh, addressing inequality. And you also want to make sure that you use clean energy, you know, instead of um, fossil fuel um, source energy. So these are the different types of things that you need to consider when you're choosing your interventions. Thanks, um, Ketrin. So we, now that we've given you the general overview of this dashboard, let's look a little deeper at it. Maximo, maybe you can explain to us a little bit about what political capital means, why it's so precious, and how you have to be very judicious in the way that you spend it. Uh, it's extremely important no? because policymakers have few choices. And in most of the countries we work, developing countries, uh, we have a huge constraint, budget constraint. So we have very little money to make decisions. And we need to find a way in which get our objective function, as I explained at the beginning, at the minimum cost, satisfying the demands of people, but also being careful that we are in a food systems, agri-food systems, and that we could create consequences and trade-offs. And also in our relationship with our neighborhood countries and with the countries we trade, for example. So the political capital will be central. And for that, you need to take into account the consequences of your choices. So providing policymakers with that level of information through this modeling that is behind this game allows them to make decisions with lower levels of uncertainty that will help them to optimize their political capital. So we are reducing the asymmetry of information they face when they have to make a decision. So imagine a Ministry of Finance that have to decide to give money to the Ministry of Agriculture to develop a cooling set of facilities across an African country so that they can minimize losses in production. He needs to have this evidence to be able to make the most possible uh, proper decision uh, so that he can optimize uh, his political capital. So that's the core behind uh, reducing the asymmetry of information that these policymakers will face. Back to you. Thanks, thanks, Maximo. So it's really a question of finding that balance between high touch and low touch, knowing where to exert that political capital and when to, um, when to step back. Um, David, uh, at the end of the day, we all have a finite amount of money that we can spend. Uh, and this game also has a budget that is finite in terms of where you can dedicate resources. How challenging is it to work within this budget and um, how hard is it for people to understand that they can't do everything they want to do? Yes, I think that um, this game is about choices and learning about choices. And of course, that we have some constraints. You know, it's not like you have a magic wand and you can start to um, have a huge pile of money to do all the investment you want. Um, but as we already discussed, you know, some investment in themselves can create new problems. You know, let's say that you increase your irrigation. Um, as crazy, every farmer will be happy, but you are going to use much more water. So in this game, of course, you have constraints. Of course, you are learning the consequence of your choice. And in many cases, also the unintended consequence of your choice. And it's like if there is only one solution, people are going to experiment. They are going to see that it's a mix of decision. But yes, there, there is a constraint. So that's what we want to design is a narrative for realistic solution, you know, understand pro and cons. And the fact that we cannot ask the society or the, uh, the policymaker to start to spend, you know, 50% of or, or GDP on the agri-food system. But smart choices could help transform the system without trying to tell the players there is only one pathway. There are different pathways you want to explore. Uh, and typically this screen is about these choices. Thanks, David. So uh, this is a dashboard. This is what you use to make decisions. As you can see, for every one of the decisions you're able to make, you can seek advice. But often the advice you get uh, might be from someone who has 
their own special interests at, at heart. So you need to evaluate all the advice you get. You need to you need to judge one decision versus another. You need to think not only for the region of the world that you're dealing with, but as you'll learn how that might impact the rest of the world. And we're gonna show you how. So after you've gone through this dashboard and made your decisions, you're able to see your results. And you see where you started. The SDGs are a roadmap to reach certain targets by 2030. Let's see how you did in the decisions you made. You start today, you see how that transforms between today and 2025, and then by 2030. Using this interactive tool, you'll actually be able to click through and see what your score was related to the SDGs. How well did you do in helping to hit those targets based upon the decisions that you made? And what's interesting is that this changes every time that you play the game for two reasons. One, because your decisions will change. And two, because every single decision you've seen here has under the hood a platform that's driven by real-time data, which means that you could play the game one week and play it a month from now, and it'll actually be different. That's one of the powerful things about developing this platform with FAO is the ability to connect it to data that can change to show us real-time things. I mean, we've all seen things that are put out into the world that are really valuable and turn into a PDF, and immediately it's out of date the moment that it becomes that PDF where it's locked into a document. This is a dynamic platform that's designed to change as we add new information into it, starting with food loss and food waste, but also allowing us to go into other thematic areas as well uh, in the year ahead. A total score. Well, I told everyone at the beginning that this is a, uh, uh, this is a, a game that's designed to show where we're gonna be not the final, like not the final version. So the screen I'm going to show you for the score is going to dramatically change uh, between now and when the game is launched later this year. So, but this is, gives you a window of what it could look like. What it could do is it could actually give you scores in those six core areas that David mentioned. It could break it down. It might even break it down into how you would score relative to other players. But most importantly. We're going to build a tool that allows you to show how you impact not just your region, but the world. And so that's the power of this platform is its ability to show you how you can impact and through your decisions, things halfway across the world. And of course, you can then go back after you've done it and uh, you can either play a different country or you can play again as the same country based upon the knowledge you've learned. So Lindsay, in a, uh, in a nutshell, uh, that's our game. Uh, that's the progress we've made. Uh, its first iteration is on food loss and food waste, but we're excited uh, to have a platform now for putting a face and a place on data. And we're excited to also collaborate with your community uh, as we continue to build it out, as we explore ways to make this, for example, a multiplayer experience, and as we, um, work in and move into other thematic areas. Thank you so much, Douglas. This was an absolutely incredible overview. We already have a lot of great questions coming in. So I really do encourage everyone, please do keep sending them in. Put the country in that you are writing from as well, just to give us some context. That'll be really interesting to see. So let's keep moving on. So I think now I would love to go to the section to kind of take a look under the hood of this incredible game. So my first question will be to Maximo. Uh, this platform provides a very detailed approach to show how policymaking works at a national or regional level to address food system challenges. But what can it tell us about the trade-offs and the unintended consequences that come with policymaking? So oh, that's exactly what we are looking at. So we take the regions so to avoid pinpointing a specific countries. You know, we, the idea here is to bring information for policymakers. But exactly the goal of the game is to give information to policymakers uh, to understand what are the trade-offs and what are the consequences no, of those of those actions. 
it's important to understand that although this is a game, <laughs> it's a lot more than a game because it has a whole infrastructure data, as Douglas was mentioning, behind the scenes. It's exactly the model we use in the Food System Summit with David to develop and measure the trade-offs of all the different actions that the summit was trying to come through so that we could say and understand what were the consequences of those. Uh, so that's what we're doing. So we are bringing it through a game, but it's basically to help and to interact with youth and with policymakers so that you understand what it implies. For, for the regular consumer, it will be great because I can know what that action could imply. Rather than going and criticizing my policymaker, I can have more information of what will be happening. So that's what the game is bringing up. Amazing, thank you. That really does make a lot of sense. So next question is for David. And the question is, it looks like there's a lot of data behind the game. And I know we also had a question about this already. So could you please describe how you use data to model these complexities? So yes, we uh, try to have a game that is rooted in uh, real data. Um, and up-to-date data, I think Douglas has already raised this point. And it's quite important because in so many debate, you have the feeling that people are, are outdated. You know, This is the world that it was 20 years ago when they were at university. That, that's not the case anymore. You know, The world has changed significantly. Uh, and the reality of the world has evolved, but also a way to measure it. So understanding and what we track. For example, uh, this first instant of the game is on food waste and loss. It's a topic that people are talking about for potentially more than 30 years now, but the actual measurement of this issue is still a work in progress. But hopefully, thanks to many initiatives, including what FAO has, has done in the re recent years, we have much better understanding. So this problem was already there 20 years ago, but now we can put numbers on it. And that's what, why we mobilize this data. And just to uh, move to some one of the question is, data in itself um, can describe a problem, but by no way can help solving it. You need to understand how these data point interact and that's where we rely on economic modeling mainly uh, that basically put this data together and build equations, but it's not just coming from, you know, uh, uh, the top of the, the mind of few crazy people. That's how this equation has been based on how the world and how people behave. Um, in average, okay? That's, I think, something very important that we have to understand that we are never telling a specific story about how a specific person is going to react, but in average, people should react like that when price go up, people consume less, or they have to cut their consumption or other things. And this is all these elements, and basically in the background of this type of game, you have models that have you know, more than uh, a couple of millions of equations trying to capture this interaction in this trade-off, and just or you, human brain cannot do it on the spot, you know. Uh, that's when the world is maybe a lot of collection of simple pieces, but put together, it's a complex system. And at one point, that's where we do this type of modeling. But this platform helps you to get there, to learn. Of course, you know, science is always evolving, but also people evolve. So how the, the behavior of people change over time, that can lead to change even in how we model things. And that we will also plan to update uh, the model based on data and, uh, and what we learn. But really, I think that the two aspects to, to keep in mind, we put data together with what I would call the state of the art in terms of, of modeling. Of course, there's assumption behind it. And uh, we are, we'll try to be as clear as possible in some of these assumptions. But to understand the main trade-off, you know, I, I do not think that there is the room to argue during hours and hours about a, a specific uh, problem. In many cases, we already have a good understanding of the main mechanism. And what we want is to make sure these mechanisms are put together with up-to-date data to build a story that sometimes we want to hear, but sometimes also we do not want to hear in order to make the right choice at the right time. Definitely. So just expanding on that a little bit, David, where does this data come from? So mainly we, we base our analysis on data coming from the UN systems overall. So of course, FAO is providing a lot of things on the agri-food system, but we use a number of household surveys. So this is survey done um, at the household level to better capture the, 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 the statue of different households. That's very important in terms of poverty because also poor households are not all the same. You have poor farmers and you have rich farmers. You have poor people in city and you have rich people in cities. Some are part of the agri-food system as producers. They can be street vendor. 
They can be uh, daily workers in a farm, or they can just be consumers. So we use also all this information that in this case is collected by countries, um, by FAO, but also by the World Bank. And so we bring them together. So there is some significant curating to make all this data make sense when you bring them together. Because unfortunately, you know, we are still operating in a world in silos, even about people that try to fix the problem. So you will hear something from the World Bank, you will hear something from FAO, you will hear something from UNEP, and sometimes that doesn't make sense. So that's why you also need researcher to bring them together. But all this curating has been done. So you don't have to know all the data, but you will be using them. And that's the, uh, the fun in this game. Lindsay, let, let me add that the beauty of this is, of course, we keep the confidentiality of the data, which is central, no? But we also use all the data, which is also central. And as David said, we have been very careful to assure that the baselines are consistent to the indicators that we have and the SDG indicators so that we can start from where the numbers that the photograph that we have today and from there see the consequences. And all this data is linked through tubes to the model and to the game, which allow us to keep them being updated. Absolutely. Thank you so much for adding that, Maximo, as well. And the last question, either for you or for David, is this is real-time data, that's correct? Real-time as much as real-time it can be. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get these data, as David was saying. When we talk about household surveys, it depends on the household survey year. So we have several sources of household survey data, the, the World Bank ISA surveys, the new service that we are doing at FAO, uh, the 50 by 2030, and so on and so forth. In the case of food loss and waste and losses, especially, which is what FAO measures from producer to wholesale included, we are trying to develop a permanently reporting of the index of food loss and waste that FAO has, has developed. But again, you know, one of the efforts that we are doing in FAO is acceleration on data. That's our new strategic framework. And as much as we can get as real as possible, we will do it. But again, not all the data will happen real time uh, because it's impossible, but we will try to update as much as possible uh, the data from the sources that we are using right now. Perfect, thank you so much. So before we get on to some more questions from our audience, and please do keep putting them in, I would love to just hand the floor over to Chloe before we begin. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. So um, like every, like a few people have mentioned earlier, we have the next round of games planned for 2022 to address other agri-food systems challenges. So I'd just like to put out a call for anyone who's interested in joining our team to help work um, on the next round of games. I will share my email address in, in the chat uh, so you can get in touch, me, in touch with me, but we look forward to getting more collaboration and making this a project for everyone to be a part of. And now I'll send it back to Lindsay for Q&A. Thank you so much, Chloe. I think that's a really great point to really drive home is that that's a really fantastic invitation to get involved and make this as dynamic and realistic and incredible and useful as possible. So why don't we get started on the chat? I know there are some great questions in the chat and I don't necessarily have them uh, geared toward one person in particular. So feel free any of you, any of you to jump in to whoever it may be most applicable to ap applicable to. So our first question is from Lisanne, and she is from the Netherlands, and she wants to know how are the consequences determined when it is based on previous data, while our environment and the country's specific contexts are changing. So what is the consequence of under or over interpretation and in modeling? And I'll put it in the chat just in case you want to reread it. So I can go briefly. So essentially, right now, we are looking at certain dimensions of consequences, which are basically related to our nature, so water, soil, land, and so on, uh, to what could be greenhouse gas emissions as a result of activities that we implement, biodiversity, uh, and also, of course, consequences on distributional impacts over labor force and, and income. Those are the ones that we have right now. Of course, as we move forward, and more data is available, those can increase. Now, within those dimensions, this is a dynamic issue, and that's why the importance of linking to data as frequent as possible so that we can look at the new baselines every year and update uh, the results. David, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yes, and, and I can uh, potentially also uh, address the question of Zaika on how we move the GDP growth to poverty reduction, because I think it's a nice way to, to link the two about 
some of the mechanics. So uh, as we discussed, we, we use um, up-to-date uh, data. We combine them with modeling because the modeling really give you the kind of backbone structure you need to understand the, the, the mechanism. It doesn't mean that the world will repeat as itself, but once again, you know, if you're a household, you are going to get your money from somewhere and you are going to spend on some things depending on, on the price of food uh, or on the price of the different product and, and, and things like this. So there is that the mechanic. And same thing, if you use land and this land has a carbon sequestration uh, capacity, um, you are either not going to capture carbon or you are going to emit it. And the world evolved, the population evolved, the technology evolved, but some, you know, these core mechanics basically take place. So of course the world, the, the, the game and the model behind it capture how the world event. And actually we go up to 2030 to see how some of your consequences impact the, the agenda, but they will take time. And um, yes, and I think we are pretty, uh, uh, comfortable about how we use the model results in, in the game. Uh, it's not about saying, okay, these specific countries will do these specific uh, policies at this specific point of time, but more to understand how different uh, policies and intervention react in different regions. And then that's a starting point for discussion. I mean, that, you know, it's not like a, a, a roadmap for policy implementation after you have finished the game. No, it's more, oh, now we understand why it take time sometimes to take decision, what really matters, how we should be careful about, and, and how we can lead to this. And just to uh, follow up on this question about GDP growth to poverty, um, the, the game and the model behind it will not start from GDP. GDP is just the result of how income is generated in your country. And this income comes from labor, but you have also you know, skilled labor and skilled labor. It comes from ownership, ownership of land. So all this income that is generated will give your GDP. But the poverty story is much more about who gets a, a share of the pie. Uh, and is it your GDP going to increase because the uh, skilled workers are going to earn more money? Let's say that you are going to uh, say, okay, I'm spending a lot of money in R&D to innovate in my food system. Uh, the first people that will benefit from it is PhD student or just researcher in uh, agronomics or robotics or all of that. So that can be good news for them on the spot. Um, if you are a poor farmers uh, and if people doesn't actually give you access to this technology, not a good news for you. So really we have this household survey that allow people to understand where they get their money from and where they spend their money on, that will generate the poverty outcome. But you have all this level detail in the background that you don't have to care about, but it's not like if, GDP and poverty is linked with a kind of simple relation. It depends. It depends on how, what you do, who gain, and potentially who lose. Um, and within poor people, you will also see winners and losers. So you can have a net effect on poverty, where you have a number of poor people that is reduced. But actually, you have some people that were poor initially that can wash off. And we try to capture this in some of these indicators. Thank you so much, David. I think that was an extremely full and detailed answer. You also addressed some other questions. So thank you so much for that. So I am going to throw a question to Douglas that I found very interesting. So as far as I understand, this is currently a single player game, but what else do you envision in terms of game design and release platforms for the future? Uh, thanks, Lizzie. Before I answer that, I want to just follow on what both what, what both David and Maximo stated. I think it's really important to know that I was very nervous to call this a game at first, Lindsay. As a matter of fact, when we started on our journey together, everyone was afraid to use the word game first. We were building something, but nobody wanted to use the word game because we didn't want to somehow potentially trivialize what's actually at stake in the, in the model and the platform that we're building, right? And as David and Maximo explained, it's extremely complicated. Right? How do you make that, that work that's complicated, actionable and uh, approachable, understandable, right? So right now we've mapped it out as a single player experience, but it's very obvious that you could do this as a multiplayer experience as well. In the short term, it's a single player experience. Once the game mechanics are in place, it's very clear that you could do a multiplayer experience to show how you have to collaborate, how you often have to 
weigh the insights and the experience of many other people in order to make a decision. And then even then, you might be making a decision that is good for your region, but might have adverse impacts on the rest of the world. So the complexity of, of this can certainly be explored in, an, uh, in a multiplayer experience. But to really get to the heart of that answer, Lindsay, I'm gonna state once again, uh, this is the World Food Forum. There's all kinds of game players and probably even game designers in this group. There are people that are budding experts in many of the domain uh, areas that this platform could embrace. This is your platform. This is your opportunity. This is your opportunity to actually become engaged with this group. If there's a strong interest in this community to build out a multiplayer experience so that the members of the forum can take this platform and go into their communities and use it to start to show people the complexities of these decisions and trade-offs, then that's what will get built. But you know, uh, it's gonna really ultimately depend upon the involvement of this group, their insights, their enthusiasm, their experience to really uh, bring a larger audience to the work and uh, to get it in front of the right people. Having said that, it does launch with a single player experience. It will be available on Android and, 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 uh, and iOS uh, so you can download it. And, and, that's where, and that's our starting point. Uh, it's, it's up to the group to decide where it goes after that. Wow, I mean, I think you couldn't have answered that any better. I think that's a fantastic call to action to this audience that we hear that we have here today. I mean, that's really what the World Food Forum is all about, right? We wanna get involved. The young people here are the future. And we just wanna drive that message home as much as possible and make sure that you know that. So your participation is really important. And I'm really glad you all are driving this message home and making sure that everyone feels included. So I am going to have another question uh, by Zaika. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And they ask, to what extent do you think that the world or the considered parties would be cooperative to achieve the desire and expected results from this game. Uh, this could be interesting possibly for Maximo or David, but feel free to jump in, whoever. So the, the hope uh, of this game is, as we said at the beginning, uh, to bring and to improve the capacity of decision makers uh, to make the proper choices and, the, and to take the proper pathways. One of the challenges we face, uh, as it was explained by David, I think, uh, is that we are in a world where we have silos and people make decisions in a silo without understanding the consequences. No? So if you remember the graph, the, the Venn diagram that shows all the interactions between the different uh, SDGs, uh, and what we are aiming here is to look at the, at the center of the core, where all the interactions happen. No? And that answers the, the comment of Kazuki at some point. But that's the goal, uh, how, how we can look at those, at those interactions. How much policymakers will use it? I think it's not only policymakers, because if academia, private sector, and, and you and everybody start to use it, then you are also making people accountable of the decisions they make. So again, it's not just an issue of talking, it's an issue of bringing evidence to make proper decisions. And that's the whole idea of the game. Uh, it is called a game because it's a game at the end of the line, but it's a real life game uh, with real data and with real tools to make the best possible possible decisions. Let me pass the floor to the others. Yes, and if I can take the bullet <laughs> now, um, I will say yes, and I think, and some of the discussion in the Food System Summit were also pointing this issue that we have the silos, but we have also the fact that some people think that they have the solution. And everything is about their solution that will basically the silver bullet uh, fixing the system. With this game, what you will see that we need a combination of action. So we need different solution used at the same time to deal with this multidimensionality of, of the, the problem we face. But also, and that's a very nice aspect of playing with different regions, you may want to be in the shoes of someone else in order to get a global agreement on something. You need to understand that, yes, if you are in Eastern Africa or if you are in Northern America, you have different problems, different constraints. Uh, and learning what type of problem the other face may help you building a solution, building consensus. 
uh, and that can lead also to the type of multiplayer game that Douglas was referring to, where we can let player interact. But first, even with a single player game, you can live different experience to, and then you can understand that crafting a, um, a solution for the challenge that we face today and that we even face tomorrow, we require everyone to make a bit of efforts and to have an understanding about um, what is the, the opportunities, but also the problem of others, you know? Should we stop eating meat? If you have a large part of your population that is pastoralist and they are very poor people, you don't want to implement that. So it's not about good and bad, it's about how we can find compromise between different stakeholders to find a solution that will basically check all the boxes we want for sustainability. Let me, let me add something also. Uh, I think it's important to understand that although this is not a multiplayer game, you are competing against yourself. Right? Because in the way you are doing the game, you are trying to improve relative to what you can do uh, in a baseline scenario. So, so there is a competition inside. You want to do better. You want to minimize trade-offs. Uh, and that's what you are, you are competing. And also, as it was mentioned by Douglas and Catherine and, and, and by uh, David and Chloe, this is just the beginning. This is just a platform. We choose food laws and waste. Uh, because it's a topic that is becoming extremely relevant today. Uh, having the levels of losses and waste that we have is unacceptable. It's, it's, it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. But the idea of this platform is to bring other ideas, so other, other issues and other potential interventions, like, for example, technological packages. We talk a lot about those, but what will be the consequences of those? What will be the consequences over land expansion, over biodiversity, over public goods in the world, like our greenhouse gas emissions? We normally think that most of the COP, COP uh, climate change actions are country level. Again, it's a silo. Because if you create greenhouse gas emissions, you're affecting the whole world. And that's what we try to capture here. So, so again, we need to be very careful on how we define things. They are global public goods, uh, and people don't understand that. They think that just by reducing emissions in my country, in my case, Peru, or in Korea, or in the US, you resolve the problem, and that's not correct. You could be creating bigger problems because what I stop producing, some other country could produce in a more inefficient way and increase emissions. So we have to be very careful. And that's, a, that's the beauty of trade. No? And that's something that the game incorporates. Thank you so much, all of you, for these answers. I think you've really created, you know, provided some diverse points of view. And I personally love that it's called a game. I think it makes it more approachable, more dynamic, and invites people in a little bit more. So we really only have time for one more question. And I just got one in from Kazuki. So why don't we go with this one? So couldn't the game be played among a number of competing single player gamers who compare scores at the end? This could be a great competition for the next World Food Forum cycle. So particularly if we can hear about the decisions that were taken by the highest scores and the lowest scores uh, multi single players could be a really great learning experience and that could actually be a great way to learn from each other too. So any thoughts on that from anyone? I think it's a great idea. Uh, yeah. it's, it's up to, it's up to, again, Lindsay, I can't underline this enough. It's up to your community to decide that, right? You should think of this as a valuable asset, a resource, a platform that your community can, can, can really look to develop. This is a, the platform really is an opportunity and an asset. It can be an opportunity and an asset for your community to take and build upon. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, every good idea ultimately needs an army. <laughs> so, uh, and at the same time, ironically, uh, every army is always in search of a good idea to follow. So, you know, the hope is that the platform can be useful to your community, can help them to share with others the things that they're passionate about, why they're passionate about, the complexities that they're trying to, uh, to meet, and can be used as a valuable resource uh, by them. You know, I want to return everybody to the chat window where Chloe from our team has written her email address. Uh, it's, it's her direct email address, which I think is great. And um, Let's start this conversation. And um, I think, you know, Chloe, if you, if you maybe would like to share um, how we can start to harness the collective uh, insight and experience of this group and, um, and maybe how you might start to, uh, to build that and support 
of the game and maybe future directions where, where the game might go. Yeah, definitely. So as you can see, there is a lot of different components to this game. We have the data side, the art, the storytelling. So I really think there's a great chance for everyone to kind of jump in and participate. And even if it's just playing through the first iteration of the game and pointing out parts where we can improve, change things to tell a better story, to make these trade-offs and con unintended consequences more apparent, um, definitely reach out to me via email. Um, we have an online community platform that we can build out so people can talk to each other, collaborate with members who are already on the team, people who are interested. Definitely, like Douglas has said, we want this to be a super open, super collaborative process where everyone can really make this tool the best that it can be and the most helpful for everyone. So I, again, put my email into the chat. Uh, so definitely, we would love to hear from you. I think that brings us to the end of the session today. We're finishing with three minutes to spare, which is really impressive. So thank you everyone so much for sticking to your times, for being organized, concise, inspiring, dynamic. It's been absolutely incredible to hear from all of you. It's been so fun to kind of think about policy making and decision making in a totally different. Thank you as well to our audience for sticking around and answer and asking us these questions that were really thought provoking. Another special thank you goes out to the audiovisual support, the interpreters, that is really not an easy job. And we really appreciate your hard work. And to the World Food Forum volunteers, everyone, thank you so much for being involved. And remember, as Douglas and Chloe were saying, really do reach out to Chloe. This is an incredible opportunity to get involved, putting youth right at the head start of everything, making sure that we are in the conversation, making decisions, and really building our own future together. So thank you, everyone, and have an amazing, amazing evening night, afternoon, whatever it is. Bye. Thank you, Lindsay, for moderating so well. Thank you all.